So my name is Samantha. I am an elder law attorney. I know that's a horrible thing to say. There are lots of people who think my name is Samantha Elder. It is not. It is Samantha Shepherd. I bring with me today a lovely blonde over here. Her name is Sarah Albright. She works with me. She has materials. If you have any questions that you're more comfortable asking her after, feel free. I um, would welcome any questions as they pop into your mind. So I'm going to talk to you today about aging and caring for those aging parents. Okay, so first of all, admit first to yourself that when you looked in the mirror this morning, you were not the same person who looked in the mirror yesterday. You have gotten one day older and you will continue to do that until the very last day that you are here on the planet. You may end up having a few hairs on your chin if you're a lady, or if you're a gentleman, you may end up having a few less hairs on your head. You may wear a hat, so we're all going to know there's a reason that you have a hat. That's part of the aging process. What does it look like in America to age? Well, it doesn't look like what it used to look like in the smaller communities where the children would move in with the parents or the parents would move in with the children. Now that's not as typical. It happens, but it is not as common. More often we age at home and then something happens and we decide that we need something else. The first alternative source of something else is getting one of your kids to drop by and look after you for a bit. Hopefully they're financially good kids and they're not dipping into your money and asking for little bitty loans. I have um, one scenario where there's a grandchild who lives in the home and he has been using his grandma's money and he has been Venmoing or cash shopping, if you're familiar with what that is. And uh, grandma was no... Um, not aware this, this is how money moves these days it used to be in her day you would show up at the bank in order to move money in our day i can look at you my face does face id and i can click a button and then mow you money for that pizza you college kid you know so she's not used to that so that starts to happen is that family members come in not always a good thing sometimes family members left for a reason and they're the ones we have looking after us Sometimes we get outside companies. Home health agencies can come in and provide care at home. They can do everything from a little bit of bill pay to what we call assistance with activities of daily living that could be toileting, transferring, bathing. What does it really look like? It looks like grandma can't pull up her compression socks. It looks like grandpa has forgotten to take his Alzheimer's beds. Outside companies doing that, they can run from 25 to 75 an hour. I think our average area is about $30 an hour for that. Then that doesn't work anymore. The kids are burned out. The kids don't want to live there or the care is too expensive. So the parents then say, well, how about we sell our house and we move to independent living? Well, who's heard of independent living? I hear of it every day. Before I was in the senior world, I'd never heard of it. What does independent living mean? These words are all marketing terms. They are all designed to bring human bodies into a community living. And if you want to be cynical, it's all about money. But sometimes they're good. And sometimes they're fantastic. Because if you lived with your husband for 50 years and he died and you've now been living two years alone and you're not motivated to cook, so you're getting skinnier and scrawnier, maybe you could have an apartment in a community and you don't actually need much besides companionship or maybe somebody saying, good morning, Susie, and you don't need much because you're an introvert. Or you might say, bingo, I'm going at five o'clock to the drink session. What is an independent living? typically provide your own bedroom, your own toilet, laundry, sometimes, definitely cleaning often once a week, sometimes meals. The norm is at least one meal. I've seen independent livings that have three meals a day. I've seen independent livings that have two. I have seen them that give you a budget and you can pick. You get 20 meals a week. Sometimes they are picnic tables and sometimes they are cloth tables. Sometimes there's a piano in the foyer. Sometimes there's a popcorn machine and a coffee machine. Some of them are fantastic. Some of them require buy-ins. What does that mean? It means that you sell your house and you've got this hot moment of $200,000 of cash. And they say, we'll take that. And I will give you back 90% of it when you're dead. Okay, wait, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But that's often what they say. Once we've re-rented your unit. So you think, oh, it's not so bad. No one ever willingly 
says, I'm so excited. Please let me be the one. I want to go to assisted living because that's independent living that failed. It's independent living plus. Sometimes they're in the same building. Sometimes they're owned by the same company. But assisted living usually means I've got a problem getting dressed or a problem getting bathed or I can't remember my meds or I can't toilet myself or a combination of that. It costs more. What's the average cost? Okay, that's a tough one, actually. It changes all the time. I only know our area. I do know that we're the cheapest place I've heard. I go to these national conferences and they'll say, oh, our independent living's 8,000, our assisted living's 15. And I go, see, I am heading back to Missouri. Because here I can see sometimes people will tell me 3,000 is independent living, 2,500, but it's bare bones up to 5,000. And then there's a range and I'm going to ask Sarah to pop, pipe in if she knows, but I would say anywhere between three and seven, big range, but there's a big, it's it's like a house, right? Any apartment complex, there's a whole different range. There's one right now on the plaza that is just, you, you know, wow. You walk in and you think, I need a little dementia to come here or can I come right now? Well, I like it. Um, a lot of it depends on the quality of food. All of these places have been struggling since COVID, not with people occupying the buildings, particularly staff. So you know how that you see the signs the other day, I couldn't believe it. I showed up at Walgreens and there was a sign on the door. I had a prescription and it said, uh, sorry, closed due to staffing. Now, mind you, I've never found a Walgreens that doesn't have a CVS on the opposite corner and CVS was open. So we were all good, but it occurred to me that that's a crazy that big Walgreens can't pick up the phone and bring somebody from another different Walgreens that really speaks to the problem that we have. But what if it's you and your health needs inside of an assisted living and there's nobody there to change your depends timely and you get diaper rash equivalent or you get bed sores or you get a urinary tract infection. So the number one thing I care about when I go to an assisted living is not going to be how gorgeous that beautiful facade is, whether they have fresh roast coffee as you walk in. It's what's the care ratio look like? What's the staffing situation going to be? How long have you guys been in business? And how? what's your attrition, your, your rate of keeping people there? I'm really concerned about my parents. I want to make sure they're looked after. Okay, what's the next level? So it's home first, bringing care in at home, then independent living, and then I mentioned assisted living. The people in the professionals on aging world, they start calling it AL. So they start talking and you, you, you go into it and you'll, you'll do it too. Are you in an IL or an AL? Like, mm, I'm independent or I'm assisted. I can tell you this from one building to another building, from Lee's Summit to Kansas City to Overland Park, there's not the same answer. You'll know your place really well, but there's not as much consistency as you would think in what is on offer. So what you have to do is like you shop for a car, you don't just show up and hop into the first red shiny one. You see, you have to go and see or find someone who can go and see for you, which is now my little comment on how interesting the industry has opened up free like realtors. So if you want to buy a house right now, you generally don't go on your own because the realtor will do it for you. Go hunting, do your contract, and we all assume that. And so we know there's a built-in fee to having a realtor. In the moving into old age, there's the same idea. There are these outfits that have now cropped up that say, you don't pay us. You, you don't pay us. You tell me, guy in the orange shirt, green shirt, whatever that, green, it's green. Where do you want to go? What do you need? Do you want a smoking place? Do you need to have pets? Do you want ground floor? I'll go find it for you. And they find it and they give you two or three to tour instead of the 25 that are in Lee Summit. Then you go in and you sign your little deal and magically you don't pay anything to your finder, but the finder is paid by the facility. So there's money that exchanges. It's not for free. I had one guy tell me, um, it was here actually, it was in Lee's Summit. And he said, um, I do this to help people. And I said, well, how do you live? You know, uh, I just wanted him to own it, that there was money exchanging hands. And that's fine. We all, we all get it. Realtors charge. There's service. 
The next one is memory care. Now, memory care, I've been an elder law attorney. I'm only a, a small, youthful child here with no gray hair to prove my age. But I know she has, no chin hairs, I promise, today. Uh, I've been in this field for, I've been an attorney for 29 years. I've only been doing elder law exclusively for I think 16 years. Memory care has evolved. Why? Because now everybody's turning 65. And with this abundance of seniors, we have dementia everywhere we go. I personally can't walk through this library without sizing up who I think has dementia. By the way, those of you online, you're missing it. This library has coffee in the front. It has uh, oatmeal and pop tarts and it's beautiful in here. It's really lovely. People are wonderful as well. You got Beth here running your show. So memory care was a fashionable term, I would say. Memory care is, we know that we have to have a population of, of people hitting 65 and some of them have memory issues. Why don't we build a building and say that it's not just assisted living, it's memory care. And I say that because some of them aren't any different. Some of them don't have different training in their staff. They don't have different activities. They don't have different foods. It's just how they market themselves. So you have to be a consumer and say, I heard there are some places that make their staff go through memory training. Had your staff been through that? What do you guys do about um, things like swallow risks that happen with people as they age and have memory concerns? I'll give you one little pause here about memory. I learned this and I haven't been able to forget it and I want to tell as many people as I can. There's a, a Kansas City is a wonderful place and we have so many resources here. One of them is the KU Alzheimer's Clinic Center. Dr. Burns is a leader in this in our area, but he says this, he says, the dementia is an umbrella. So everybody will have some dementia, right? You got an umbrella. What's normal aging? I can't remember the guy who sat behind me in middle school he used to irritate me, or I can't remember, where did we go? Where did I get those shoes? Um, or you say hi to somebody you see in the store and you're like, what was her name? That's okay. Those are normal moments. So that's still under dementia, but what, what are the kinds of dementia? There's also Alzheimer's, which is not a lot. It's a thin sliver of the dementia, but it's the meanest in my opinion. It's super aggressive. Well. Everybody has their experience with dementia and they're sort of what they consider the worst, but this, this frontal temporal and those people kind of act like they had, um, um, they seem to stay the same. Whereas with Alzheimer's, they finally get diagnosed and their trajectory is so fast and their life expectancy is somewhere between, some studies say eight, some say 10. It's, and then you ask the person, when did you first see signs? So they've gotten this diagnosis now, but maybe they saw signs back then. So whenever you look in the mirror and you see yourself and you say, okay, I know I'm aging. Um, that's okay. Samantha said, I can age. I can get a chin hair or I can forget a name. When do I know if I have a problem? Ha, 50% of people with dementia, they don't think they have it. I want to be them because I think the other half are depressed. They're depressed because it's terribly sad to think that you are losing yourself every day and that you're going to be a burden to someone and that you're physically are fine, but that you will, you'll be peeing and pooping in your undies and you won't know anything better. That's a terribly depressing thought. You won't recognize your loved ones. So I want to be the 50% of dementia people that don't think there's a thing wrong because then I won't be on antidepressants. There you go. So that's what I would call a hop, skip, and a dance through the basics, at home, independent living, assisted, memory care, and then the finale. The finale, which isn't hospice. I was actually going to a finale, meaning the nursing home. Um, I, I will do my nursing home. Since I mentioned hospice, let me just tell you this about hospice. It's not what it used to be. Hospice to us all meant, oh, people, 24 hours, vigil, dying. No, in my experience in the last decade or so, it has been a lot less aggressive than that. Many people of my clients graduate, graduate from hospice. Is hospice one big community? No, there's over 60 providers 
they're paid under the Medicare program, it's a good business model. You open a hospice company, you go through the approvals, now you're the 61st, and then you go into the community. So are all hospices equal? No, some are have been around longer. Some have, um, and sometimes become, with age, I can tell you that being around longer means something, that there's some um, history and experience not just in the person that's showing up to provide for you, but in the bumps along the road. So in my opinion, hospice is wonderful. I think it is not as utilized as it could be because there's a fear factor. If I say hospice, it means death. It doesn't. It means that you're on a decline. It means in theory, uh, check me on this one, Sarah. I think it means that you are likely to pass within six months or there is a possibility that you will. For most people, there's some easy, easy ways to find out if you qualify. You talk to your primary physician and you get the primary physician to give you a referral. And the referral you can take to any one of the 60 plus places and they have somebody come out and they do an assessment. Part of that assessment is, have you lost, is it 10% body weight? I'm not a hospice person, but I learned this vicariously through my clients. So keep in mind, Samantha has had clients who had hospice and they graduated. And what was they receiving? They were at home or independent living or assisted living or nursing home. So you can get hospice anywhere along the road. Hospice in some of my clients' cases meant two times a week, a bath or shower, bathing. It meant somebody coming once a week, up to five times a week to do vitals. So I've seen lots of different things. And you may have another story to tell me about what it is in your family, but don't close your mind and say, we're not having hospice. That means we've given up on dead. It's not what it means. It means that you're taking advantage of a free program that's very easy to access. Primary care doctor gives you a referral. Take the referral to one of 60 plus. They come to your house. It is without cost. And that's a big one. So that opens the chapter to uh, cost, the conversation of cost. And cost also goes with my last stop, which is the nursing home. Nursing homes, I remember a nursing home when I went with my grandmother and they were different. That was a time when I think they were still mostly women back then, but I remember going with my grandmother to visit people and there were a lot of very high functioning people that were in nursing homes. By and large now that's not the case. When I see people who are in nursing homes, they are very, very needy. They are getting, they need assistance with diapering, toileting. Um, when I say that, I mean, they are often incontinent of not just bladder, but also bowel. Not always. Um, there are very few places around here actually who can help um, cope with a trach. There, is, uh, there are a couple of nursing homes that can cope with the trach or feeding tubes, but most um, most of us, I, I probably would say we've all visited somebody in a nursing home and found that it is very harsh to your sensibilities. It is uh, depressing and um, we can make the most of it, but it's never anyone's goal to end up in a nursing home. So I have four sons and they make a lot of jokes about what they're going to do when they put me in a nursing home. Mind you, I talk every day when I come home about, you won't believe this poor guy I met, he had Parkinson's and Parkinson's people don't know they have dementia. 60% of Parkinson's people also have dementia. And oh my goodness, that would be the worst. And so my kids, have, they've got it figured out. We're going to bring, bring you Reese's peanut butter cups, Reese's and milk duds. And we're going to put you in the best closest to the, your other brother nursing home. So they're great with me, my boys. But the goal on um, a nursing home is to find out if you have to, you have to. And when I say this, I'm not very tall. I'm five foot two. And I was going to tell you what I weighed, but that would be rude. I'd lie. But my weight, if I cannot move me, not one of you in here can move me. It's going to take two and a machine. It's, it's if your spouse or your loved one is at home and they need that level of care, you are forced. You're not choosing it because you've had enough. You're Well, that may be the case, but you're choosing it mostly because they need care you cannot do. It's breaking you mentally, it's breaking you physically, but also it's not kind. Now, I have my own parents. My dad is now in heaven 
and I experienced my mother trying to look after my dad at home for all of my legal years, nothing prepared me to help my mother because she's still my mother. And she was very adamant that she wanted to look after my dad at home. And he got a bed sore and then he got another bed sore. And I was getting really mad at my mother until I realized she felt that she had to, just like all my clients. At what point are you hurting them by not finding the right care? I don't know that answer. I don't know that answer. I pray for you that you can have faith in a God or my God and um, can seek some peace. And that is when you know that the right time is there. And sometimes for me, it seems like the hospitalization is a triggering event. What do I mean? You've been pondering about whether you want to put your dad into the nursing home. Your mother's been gone a few years. Dad's just does not want to go from the house, but dad's shrinking and dad's ornery. And sometimes dad will pass out where well, you go to see dad and he's on the floor of the kitchen. Turns out he's been there for a day and he broke a hip. And what happens? You've got no choice. You're going to call 911. He goes into the hospital and here goes this story. This works the same every time. Three days is the magic number, 72 hours. He needs to be there and he needs to be admitted. None of this observation baloney. He's admitted. And that triggers rehab because he's over 65. He has Medicare. It's not automatic. You need this three days. So you can't walk into your dad lying on the floor and say, we need to put you in some rehab. You're not walking great. We have to go the hospital route. But that hospital route, in my experience, is the door. It is your one graceful opportunity that you're not the bad kid saying, dad, you got to go. It's it finally reached a point of crisis. He goes to the hospital. They say, here's your three days, or your three nights, excuse me, 72 hours. Mr. Smith, you need some rehab. And rehab is conducted mostly skilled rehab in sites that are actually connected often to nursing homes. Not always. We have a few that are standalone. So most of the time, no, nursing homes have a wing or they integrate. But most of the time they, they have a wing that is the rehab wing. And then you go and you start your rehab. Now, number one question, how many days do I get in the nursing home for free? You get zero days in a nursing home for free. If you just start with that premise, you get nothing for free in this country, right? What do you really get for free? Hospice, true. Will hospice look after you in a nursing home? No, they're an add-on. You don't. You, are there actual hospice houses that are free? Yes, very few of them. And they only want you in the last couple of days of life. This is not a go and be looked after. They don't do anything for you to improve you. That is not what you get in a hospice home. So dad, kitchen floor, hospital, three days, skilled, attention. He needs somebody actively helping him move his body, learn how to stand up again. And that happens inside of what we call a rehab. And the rehab is part of a nursing home most often. How, do, how long does he get for free? If he had his three days and he has Medicare, he can get up to 100 days. I need to do this because that doesn't happen. You know, truthfully, in the last calendar year, not one of my clients, I see client after client all day long, every day, except for Saturday and Sunday, sometimes. Uh, no, people don't get 100 days. That's the max that they can get under Medicare, but they don't. They get usually three weeks. Just say in your head, I'm getting about 20 days. Then there's a copay system that comes on, and then you have to get evaluated to see if you're progressing, if you need the rehab. So it's not some mean person at the nursing home. The nursing home is filling out paperwork to submit to Medicare to see if they'll get reimbursed. If they do something fraudulent, they'll lose their Medicare license. So they're not doing that. They love the Medicare dollars. Don't get me wrong, because you can get, I would say, anywhere from, I'll be guessing, $800 to $10,000 a day for rehab in the most acute settings it's high but it's dollars they want they, they need to legitimately know they're going to get them so right out of the hospital you are very very tasty if you've been there three days there are marketing teams that are trying to build relationships to get you into the rehabs but those are short term 
let's say 20, 21 days, then we need to decide, do you go home? Do you go to long-term care? And that's the, the pivotal point that I tell you may give you that open door to help dad transition. I had a lady yesterday whose husband had 22 years worth of Parkinson's. And I, I think she she's the max I've ever heard of. Um, Parkinson's is not typically that long in its lifespan, but she has a husband with this. And he now reached a point where she had to pop him into the hospital. Um, and then from the hospital, he, here's his problem. Uh, with Parkinson's came to mention, he's trying to rip out his stuff. Now, he he has to have, when I say rip out his stuff, if you can visualize the guy with stuff going in here and stuff going out here, and he doesn't want it. He's also got a catheter, which I'm not a boy, but man, that would hurt. So they they have now a, a way they put in um, catheters that are not through the painful part. Let's go with that. But if you are young um, and foolish, or demented, you might want to mess with it and, and cause it infection or pull it out. So they now have him with a sitter, which makes him really challenging to place somewhere outside of the hospital because they don't have sitter capabilities. Who's that going to be? So this particular lovely lady that came to me yesterday said, I know that I need to talk to you because I don't want to lose everything that I have. And I said, you will not lose everything that you have. Tell me why you think that. And she said, well, I know how much it costs to be in a nursing home. I said, well, yeah, it's expensive. It's somewhere between in rural parts of Missouri. I have seen still people under 6,000, close to the Kansas City area where we're over 12,000. So there's a range, but it's pricey. So nine, 10,000 is kind of normal. And she said, yeah. and." Um, that will eat into our savings pretty quickly. And then I'll have nothing left for me and I'm a lot younger than him. And I said, don't worry, you don't have to use all this money. There's some, there are solutions. So let's go back to, if you're in the nursing home, long-term care insurance is solution number one. Long-term care insurance you cannot get if you have something significantly wrong with you, like a dementia diagnosis or cancer. Very few of my clients have long-term care coverage. It's expensive to get it, um, it may be worth it. It's a judgment call, but that's the first place I look. Do you have long-term care insurance? Then I say, Medicare. They say Medicare pays, right? And I say, no, Medicare never pays. It pays zero, but it might pay for some rehab, which looks like it's in a nursing home. So they'll say, well, my friend's husband, he was in um, Ashton Court. He was in John Knox. He, he was in the nursing home and uh, Medicare paid for him. And you'll know that he was actually getting rehab in the nursing home, but getting rehab for that max of 100 days magic that never happens. It's probably only 20 days. But no, long-term care insurance, no Medicare. All right, what about VA? VA, if you were a veteran, we have two nursing homes that are close to here. One's in Warrensburg and one's in Cameron that you can get on a wait list to get into. And then your cost is really low. Oh, I think it's about 2,100. We should check on the most up-to-date numbers. Wait list, hard to get into. Don't take spouses, only veterans. Warrensburg, Cameron, options. Um, other options, yes. This took me years to figure this one out. Honestly, why? Because I don't know. I couldn't find a, there's no massive book. I need to write one. If you were injured in the military and you were service connected at least 70%, then there are a handful of nursing homes that have a handful of beds that will pay 100%. Now, I'm telling you, I have thousands of clients and I've had less than a dozen who've had that deal. It doesn't happen very often that it's 70% or more service connected disabled, okay? Um, ironically, in my family situation, my dad was 100% service connected disabled because he had uh, Agent Orange exposure and my mother wasn't putting him anywhere. So it's not about the money. At some point it's about, I'm not doing that. So money is a big scary factor, but it's generally not the original obstacle to placement for my clients. It's there in the back of their head. So very few veterans have it. 
but it is something and not all nursing homes, there are a handful of nursing homes that will accept a handful of clients. The one that pops into my head, uh, it's in it's Del Mar Gardens. I know they have four or five beds that are available because they have a contract with the VA. So there literally is not a dollar that's spent. Okay, the last one, um, uh, before I get to the fun one, the last one is um, your savings. So it's your 401k, it's your home equity line, it's your CDs, it's your money. That's how you pay. Those, that's, that's the nursing home route. And then the fun one. So I think pre pretty much my name is associated with the fun one. It's called Medicaid. Medicaid is a federal program combined with a state program. So every dollar coming out of the feds is called Medicaid, and then each state gives its own name. So I have, gosh, it's, it's more than 10 years ago that, that Medicaid started calling itself Mo Health Net in Missouri. I don't know why that name is, why that's better than Medicaid, but okay, we have Mo Health Net here. Um, Kansas, our sister state over there, has Can Care. That one makes me laugh. But so Mo Health Net, there are over 25 kinds of Medicaid, of Mo Health Net in Missouri. That's confusing to people who work in it. It's super confusing to those of you who'd be coming to it one time for the nursing home. The rules for each of the 25 are different. Some require income limits, some require asset limits. So whatever you hear from your neighbor or your book club lady, you need to flush it down the sink and find out specifically individually what matters for your parent or for you when you're considering what your Medicaid eligibility rules are. Now, the quick and dirty answer is just about anyone can get eligible for Medicaid. The complex answer is there are manuals and manuals and manuals about how to get it right. The simple, easy button is if you have no money and you've never given away any money, then you'll be okay without any ex extra planning. And in Missouri, it was $1,000 and then it was two and then it was three, four and five. It went up every year in July for the last five years and now we go cost of living. So it's 5,300 and change. So 5,300 and change is all that one human can have in assets of any kind and get Medicaid. Plus a house, which you won't live in because you'll be in the nursing home and the state will put a lien on that house. So it doesn't really mean you can have a house. Plus a car, but you gotta be the one driving it or it's gotta be parked in the nursing home. Plus a funeral plan and the funeral plan has to be irrevocable. Now, that's a stupid word to put on it, but here's what happened. People would buy $15,000 funeral plans and they'd say, we're broke, we're broke. And then they would put mama in the nursing home and then they would go in and cash it out. So the state said, no, no, time out. You have to give us something in writing that says, this funeral plan cannot be changed for cash. And that's what it means to be irrevocable. It just means you bought it and you can't get your money back. So... Those rules of the 5,300, those are single people rules, very different for married people. But I want to just go into one little bunny hole with my single people and explain it is not the same for my married people. For my single people, there is a five-year look back. And I struggle with explaining this in a simple way. So I go to this, you knock on the door of the nursing home, Hello, it's Independence Manor. I'm here. My name's Samantha Shepherd. I can't wait to live in your lovely nursing home. I am broke. I've got less than 5,300 and I'm in. I got my car in the back. I got my house, but I know I'm in. They'll say to you, what have you done in the last five years? On the form, subject to perjury and serious examination, meaning they check car records, they check house records. They now have extended powers to check bank records without your know-how, but they always check property and they always check cars and they uh, require physical proof of all of your assets that you have to submit in. If two years ago, you gave $15,000 to your best friend, you're in trouble. If two months ago, you gave $6,000 
to your son because he needed a new car, you're in trouble. So, so it's a five years before you get to the door, right? So it's 2023, I'm knocking. 22, 21, 20, 19, 18. What did I do from 2018 to now? And this causes a lot of stress for people. But here's why the rule exists. It exists because people would intentionally try to impoverish themselves and say, I'm broke now. I'm coming. I'm broke. I gave all my money away. Now, this is funny. You could go to the, the boat and have a really great weekend and lose everything you had. And you would sail right into the nursing home and get Medicaid. But if you Instead, you're a good steward of your money and you sail right by the church and you write him a check, you are not getting that Medicaid, okay? I did not write the rules, but that is the truth. You cannot give money away to a charity. You cannot give money away to a child. In this book of tricks that's in my brain, right? There are exceptions and the exceptions are significant. One of the exceptions that I love, it's my personal favorite, is you may give money to your disabled child. And this one makes me get emotional and I care about this more than any, but if you have ever had a child with a disability, even if you don't own it that they have a disability, which I was one of those, he's perfectly normal. Hmm. You wonder what is gonna happen to that kiddo. In fact, you give birth and you wonder what's gonna happen. You love them with all this potent power and you want to leave them safe. And so you think, I'll just, give them the house if I ever die and 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 he'll be able to live in that house and um, his brothers will help with food or utilities or rent or something. Well, rest assured, the state of Missouri agrees with you that we need to carve an exception for individuals who have a special need. It has to be a special need that is recognized by social security. So obvious ones, Down syndrome, autism, developmental delay, which we can't use any words, the cognitive impairment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I've seen lots of mental illnesses of late, uh, some bipolar diagnoses. You are someone who receives social security disability and they will know when they got it and they will be able to usually procure that letter for you. That is enough. So here's my hypo. This lady on the front with the lovely red hair, she goes to the nursing home and she has half a million dollars in savings. She can get in that first month and it will cost her nothing because she's going to set up a special trust that will hold all of that half a million for the benefit of her disabled child. It also doesn't have to be her kid. This one is a little crazy to me. It could be any person with a disability. I've yet to meet the sweet, lovely lady with red hair who's all about giving a half a million dollars to someone she doesn't know who has a disability, but that would work too. So my point is sometimes, this, uh, there's a reason, Some, sometimes there is a um, societal need to look after people who are uh, definitely can't survive alone. I get that. Um, and these trusts have a provision in them, and they should, that says, in the event that there's any money left, the state of Missouri is repaid to the extent of any dollars left. That's because the mother did it for the son. So let's say with your half a million, you put half a million in this trust right here for the benefit of your son. And somebody's in charge of this money and they're paying for him and looking after him. And then when he's dead, there's still 50 grand left. Well, if we owe 50 grand or more to the state of Missouri, they get that. So it only works in certain circumstances. What are some other things single people can do? Um, there are some people who question this so I want to beat it really fast and hard and down and say I can get someone on Medicaid if they have five hundred thousand dollars sure I can um how well it depends on the person it depends on what is right for them and what is right for their family sometimes it takes a period of time it's instant if there's a disability but most of the time we use the rules the same way you guys rule use the rules when you file your taxes so when you go to file your taxes i'm going to grab which sip of my coffee right here hold on when uh, i'm back when you go to pay your taxes you don't say uncle sam i worked at the library i worked this many hours my total revenue was 10,000 here's a check for 
the highest percent I can give you. You don't do that. What you do is you pour over all the exceptions. Do I get to deduct one of the kids? What about the dog? Can I deduct the, the business expense of you're working at home now, honey? Is that an in-home office? That's our job, right? We try to find the most exceptions that we can find in order to make the best use of our own dollars. That's what I do in the context of Medicaid, which allows me often to come up with many ways to save money for individuals. The most glorifying way for me to save money is this side, the married side. It's satisfying because the lady I told you about that had the 21 years of looking after her husband with Parkinson's, she doesn't need to go poor. Why? It, it's not my law that says it, but it's our law. It says, if you're married, your money and his money are in the same pot. We don't care how you labeled it. You can put your name on one account and his name on another. It doesn't matter. You're married. It is your legal obligation to provide for his health care. That's okay conceptually. So now what would happen? The people who are sick with Parkinson's, they would divorce because we're well, not paying for him. You know, this is my 401k and he's the one who needs the people would divorce. So we were promoting divorce. So we came up with these laws, the prevention of spousal impoverishment. They make sense to me. Conceptually, we want people to stay married. We like the institution of marriage, sort of, sometimes. I don't know. It's a strange culture we live in right now. We can't, we'll just leave that. So so the lawmakers that made these spousal impoverishment laws, they like marriage. So we have these rules. So the simplest way to say it is if you are a married couple and one of you is really sick, we do not lose the house. We do not lose the car. We do not lose any of the savings. We just have to know the rules in order to get this person onto Medicaid. Um, and sometimes that's freeing knowledge um, for the wife who's looking for um, a comfortable way to shift the responsibility of caring for her husband to someone else. And sometimes it's devastating because I've now told her she can do it. There's no real barrier, you know. So it's it's a double-edged sword. Financially, it won't burden her. There's this is kind of a weird th thing to say. It doesn't always work out that way. But think of it like this. I always think of the pile. I have this Rapunzel, let down your hair, kind of like pile of gold idea. There's. Um, I, I was watching last night with my son. He was watching some cartoon Viking thing and the bad guys went in and took all the loot. And it's exactly that. It's like you see a chest with all these coins and funky Viking hats. And I think of that as the resources. And then there's income. And that's just that stream of money that comes in every month. Everything I've been talking to you is how do we save this big pot of your resources, which includes the house and the car, the 401k, the CD, the IRA, the savings, the annuities. How do we save that? But there's still income. And income is usually social security, sometimes a pension, but almost always I've got a husband with his social, a wife with her social, and maybe a pension. That is different. Your, whoopsie, sorry, slap in the mic there. Your income is your income. You are not obligated to take your income to pay for someone in the nursing home. So say you had no money, Zippo money in the pot of loot and he needs to go in the nursing home and you can pop him in the nursing home and you can keep your income. And if your income isn't high enough, according to our crazy standards, and that's a number that moves, you can have some of his income. But for the most part, the first rule is that the income of each of you stays with you. And then we have to wiggle. So let me give you a hypo so you're not worried. Let's say you have 1500 of social security and he has 1500 of social security. He goes into the nursing home. He took care of, there's no, there's no resources. There's no pile of Viking loot. So he goes off to the nursing home and his cost is 1500 and you get to keep your 1500 That's the starting place. But then there are a few rules. Missouri lets him keep 50 bucks so that you can, I was going to say buy shaving equipment, but that would be unkind in your case. So let me say, um, uh, what else could you do with it? You could get your hair curled. So you can use that $50 for your personal needs, whatever you want, tobacco, sodas, that's your $50. So out of his $1,500, now he's down to $1,450 that he's writing the check to. Ah, pause. What else can he keep? He has a really good 
Blue Cross Blue Shield policy in addition to Medicare, and he's paying $350 a month for it. Well, not going to keep that now. You're in the nursing home. You know what? We are going to keep that because they let us keep that $350 we need for his premium. So now instead of $1450, $1450 minus $350, I'm down to $1100. So now his check to the nursing home is $1100. He's got $50 bucks play money and he's got enough to pay for his. Um, insurances, his Medicare and his supplement. Okay. What else? Now I go to her. 1500 What? That's not enough to live on. 1500 is below the threshold. The threshold right now is at 2100 ish So let's say it's 1500 and the threshold is 21 You get to have 600 of his. 600 to get you to the minimum. So, how, so now I was at 1100 1100 minus 600 Now his bill that we write each month to the nursing home is 500. I know. I'm a lawyer. Lawyers don't do math, so I kept it simple. He originally was at 1500. He kept 50 bucks out for personal needs. He kept 350 out to pay his medical premiums. You got to keep 600 for you because you didn't make enough. He's writing $500 check for his entire month's care. But what if you have rent or you're in assisted living? Oh, I get more. So the most you can ever get is every dime he's got. So you're never going to get more than his 1500. So ultimately, he could be free in the nursing home. No one's going to write you a subsidy check, but you might be able to keep both incomes. That was the fastest explanation under the history of man of how you can possibly get a married couple into a nursing home. But the basic rules for the married couple, she keeps the house because she's the healthy one, right? In my scenario, she keeps the house. There is no cap on the dollar amount. I don't care if it's a $500,000 house. She's married, no value, top. She keeps the car, unless there's a farm or something. She needs it for work. She keeps a car. She keeps um, the funeral plan for her and for him. Um, she keeps up to one half of their non-exempt assets. So a lot of their stuff. And then we can do what we call spend down. And spend down is a process of getting her below the, the state dollar amount, which is not for today's discussion, but there are, do not do spend down without guidance. You are going to make me cry if you do that because you don't have to do it on frivolous things. You do not have to spend down your money. You could turn the spend down into an income source. So know that the married people can instantly get Medicaid if they follow the right steps. The single people, they can save a portion of what they have accumulated in their pirate loot during their life. And with the exception of the special needs person they could give it to, they could save all of it. So I think that I'm supposed to talk up to one o'clock. And so I've left a five minute cushion in there for questions. And I see there may be some on here. It says there's some chats. I'm going to go see what the chat is. Or, okay, the chat's just talking about hearing things. Okay. All right, got it. So if you want to hear a particular answer to a question, take a minute now and give it a chat. Or if you are uncomfortable asking a question, knowing that I'm standing in front of people, um, you can write it down and give it to Sarah. Now, do you have any questions, my dear? Do you have any? You look like you did. I have some familiarity, and since I'm not sure how much you heard, I'll say that the question from our audience was, do I know, would I share a little bit about what veterans' benefits might mean to the surviving spouse? So stereotypically, we are now talking mostly about women who are the surviving spouses of our World War II guys. There are a few of those left, the women that were younger than our World War II guys. And now we're, we're, we're into Korea, um, just, just demographics of the people I see and the ages of when they would have served. They would have served when they were young men mostly, and now their wives are in their 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, some Vietnam as well. The number of 
scary fortune hunters in this area has kind of pulled me out of it for a time. Um, there is money. The VA has six or seven different what I call silos. They don't connect. So what I mean by this is here's my silo that I just told you about that is the VA nursing home, okay? The VA nursing home, all the rules about it have nothing to do with the rules about the VA hospital. And they also have nothing to do with another silo, which is these pension benefits. And they're very confusing. A surviving spouse of a veteran can get assistance monthly in the form of income. It's not taxable income. She had to have been married to him for at least a day. She had to have been married to him and living with him unless he moved into a nursing home when he died. He had to have been discharged anything other than dishonorable. So medical discharge is okay. He had to have served at least one day during wartime and 90 days continuously. And wartime did not mean boots on the ground. It just meant one day when the war was going on. So he could have been in Pittsburgh, doesn't matter. There are, so those are the, the preliminary, you know, if you were married to the veteran, look into it. Um, if, uh, if you divorced, forget it, you're done. Um, if he'd moved out and you were separated, forget it, you're done. If he was discharged dishonorably, forget it, you're done. It is also tied to money. If you have, remember my, I, I'm saying it four times, so you're getting tired of me, but there's the, the pile of loot and then there's income. It's tied to both and there are different rules. For many years, they wouldn't give us a dollar amount. And so we guessed. We would say, I was the queen of guessing. I would say at that point, I said, if you had more than 25,000, forget it on the single people and about 50,000 on the married people. Well, they changed the rules and they came up with a number and they tied it. It's about, oh, I should know the exact number, but I've stopped doing these applications myself. 147,000 is what I'll guess at the number without looking it up. It's nice to have a number. That's a lot of money that a single person might have. It doesn't matter whether they're single or married, it's the same number. The house doesn't count, but when you sell the house, it does count. So you can, there's a trick to it, of course, there's a trick to everything. And this was really, had I written the rules, the house would have disqualified you and there you would have been. But if you put the house into an irrevocable trust and then you sell the house, the, the house sale proceeds don't count. So that is one planning technique that is still there. But if there's assets in the pile of loot that's, let's say, 50,000, 80,000, 100,000 and a house, then you qualify to go to the next step. And the next step is a huge one. And that's monthly income. And this is not that hard. It's hard to explain. But the simplest way to say it is, if you take every penny that you earn, and it's in front of you in like a little pile of money, don't look at that dollar amount when you look online that says you have that amount. Look at what is left after you've spent your money all month long on the depends that you needed to buy him for incontinence, the caregiver that you had to buy, or the independent living, or the assisted, all of these costs. If his money goes below zero on what the income considers, what, what they can, the VA considers as income, then we'll get their full enchilada of dollars. So their, their full maximum monthly amount we could get if we're spending the money, but you can never go ahead of time and say, tell me what you would give me if I would get help. No, the answer was zero. You have to spend it and then say, I'm spending this much money on care. Will you reimburse me? The, the biggest hurdle that I've seen with people, whoopsie, I stepped out of the view here. The biggest hurdle that I've seen with people failing to qualify for the VA dollars is they don't actually have the level of care. And that means that my mother is a surviving spouse of a veteran and she is 80 years old and frail, but she doesn't have anybody that she needs to look after her yet. So if she reaches assisted living point, we're okay, right? Then I can get some of that money. Before then, no money. So it's only to pay once you've reached a need. So in advance, it's good if you sit down and you discuss, well, 
I think in about six months, she could move to assisted living. In the meantime, this is what I would say then, hire Susie from the church. Hire Susie from the church to establish a pattern of needing care. And then we can apply to the VA because we're already spending the money. And that'll make it easier when you do move mom to assisted living. Okay, I have crossed the one o'clock threshold. Um, do you have two questions on the box? Um, one, what do you think of senior housing apartments that are not assisted living? Would you put them in a separate category? I would, yeah. Senior apartments are... Um, Everything's marketing in my mind. So that actually goes into two categories. Senior apartments are the over 55 club that you've seen, which now that I'm approaching that number, I find that we're ridiculously young. But in theory, 55 year olds are old and they want to live together in globs. Those, those kind of, <laughs> those kind of people, <clears throat> um, there are no parks. You don't actually get anything other than community spirit. You remember in the independent living, I said you get, um the community spirit but you also get at least a meal a day and you get people coming in to change out linens typically in the senior communities that are just over 55 you get nothing other than what they individually want to say you get access to the pool but there are reduced housing senior housing apartments that are based on money that you make they exist we have some <sighs> This is being recorded, so I will be, uh, if you could afford to not be there, you would afford to not be there, okay? So it is subsidized, it's like HUD housing, it is the equivalent, section eight. So if you have other means of surviving, then you would not want to be in a subsidized apartment based on what I have seen. Um, I have a client right now, well, stick, sticking to facts. I have a client right now that had bed bugs, we moved her out and got rid of the bed bugs, even though the building said they got rid of them. Okay, they were there and you know what, once they're there. So so it's some of my people have done a fabulous job living because that's what they had. That's, that's the best they could do, trying to be delicate in my word choice. Um, the other question I see, uh, they want to know how to reach me. So my name is Samantha, like the witch from, Bewitched, Samantha Shepherd. Shepherd is spelled S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D. And hold that thought. Um, so I own a law firm that has offices in north of the river. And I was on the plaza, but the price was just too high. So now I'm in corporate wards off of 435 and I have an office in the Northland and I often can make myself available at a nursing home if a client needs me. I was gonna give you a business card to stick on the screen, but I couldn't find one. So my phone number is, uh, she's gonna tell me what my phone number is. It's kind of sad, I don't know it. It's 816-979-3000. I've had this phone number for 15 years, 816-979-3533. So there we go. I don't know if that's legible or not. Yeah, I typed it in chat. Well, thank you. All right, well, I appreciate your time today and hopefully I gave you some positive, uplifting thoughts. All right, take care. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you for everybody for coming both online and uh in person um